My journey into social and political anarchy was completely unexpected by virtually everyone around me. I was born and raised within a traditional Greek American family in which my parents were both the children of first and second generation immigrants. I went to college immediately after high school at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, where I studied psychologia, psychology, Que philosophia and philosophy. In college, I took on several extracurricular activities to occupy my time and build up my resume, one of which included becoming the president of the psychology club instituted by my academic department. Yeah. At one club meeting, not particularly unlike any prior, one of our student members caught my attention. Her legal name was Feather. She had started college in her 40s as part of her non-traditional journey through life. She was divorced, but presently had a cool, elusive boyfriend who was older than her. <laughs> there we go. And she worked as a bartender when she wasn't in class. Feather spoke up to suggest a possible volunteer opportunity which could boost our club's community engagement, Asheville Prison Books Project, a local organization which, unbeknownst to me at this introduction, was run by an anarchist collective. Anarchism was such a foreign subject matter to me that in my naivete, I did not even realize that Asheville Prison Books Project was run by an anarchist group when Feather was explaining it to us by selectively choosing to use words like collective instead of organization or member instead of leader. The mission of Asheville Prison Books Project, or APB for short, was to distribute gently used paperback books to incarcerated persons at jails and prisons throughout the Carolinas. Feather clarified that as volunteers, we would fulfill handwritten requests directly from prisoners with books that were housed in a glorified library, AKA the back room at a local indie bookstore in downtown Asheville. The way that Feather framed APB as a volunteer opportunity for service work oriented college students like ourselves made the whole concept of it seem inoffensive and also doable. Within the coming weeks, our community service partnership between Asheville Prison Books Project and the UNCA Psychology Club began. For the next year and a half of my college career, I became a regular volunteer with APB. And although I initially started volunteering with them solely through the lens of the psychology club, I soon began to volunteer my time to the cause independently and unattached to any outside groups. As someone with a passion for helping others and more specifically, those in compromised positions, I absolutely loved reading the letters from incarcerated persons, picking out books which met their request and packaging it all up with a handwritten response directly from me. Usually, it was a statement to the effect of, I hope the words in these books inspire you to continue learning and growing even while you're on the inside, because you will always deserve to learn and grow no matter where you are. Peace, Asheville Prison Books Project. And after some time, it soon became signed with Peace, Gabriella. In the dinginess of that back room, beneath the pale light of a singular lamp, and amongst the smell of old paperback books that no one else wanted, one of the other regular volunteers, C80, always used to say, we send them books while they're in prison so that they'll do the same for us someday while we're in prison. <laughs> C80's point about that sense of reciprocity sticks with me to this day. I had never grown up dreaming that someday I would go to prison. But through this firsthand experience of communicating directly with those who were incarcerated, I began to understand that many people are raised to think that the only thing they will ever become is a person in a prison. I was so inspired by the mission and values of APB that as time continued, I began attending events organized and promoted by other volunteers within the collective. Frequenting the local indie anarchist bookstore called Firestorm Books and learning everything which I could comprehend about anarchism as a 22 year old Greek Orthodox Christian church going college student. 
I'm sure you can only imagine the shock, awe, and horror that my Greek-American family had in learning that I, their self-described virgin who can't parallel park, had turned to the political dark side and become an anarchist. It was that liberal arts education. God damn it. My aunts, uncles, and grandparents were particularly terrified that my self-described anarchism would interfere with everything I had ever dreamed of and worked towards. Getting a job, pursuing a master's degree, having a, in their words, respectable spouse, all in that order. But in all honesty, I wasn't really phased by their fears for me. After all, I was always known within my family dynamic as the one who pushed boundaries and wasn't afraid to shake things up. So nevertheless, I persisted in my resistance. I continued in my involvement with APB and met a cast of interesting characters who became my friends along the way. In particular, a guy named Ben. Ben was a drifter, and for that reason, he was truly unlike anyone I had ever met before. He was tall with a mess of long, dark brown hair that was seemingly always as untamed as he was. He was also kind-hearted, considerate, and very approachable. Unlike me and most of my core friend group at the time, Ben was not a college student. While he was within the typical age range of most university goers, Ben had not pursued higher education at that point in his life. What Ben instead chose to pursue was freedom from the overbearing expectations of his white, middle-aged parents and greater rat race of the northeastern United States in the form of not going to college, leaving his home state of Maryland, and moving to western North Carolina, all the while living nomadically. But when I first met Ben, I did not yet know just how much of a nomad he was. You see, that was the thing about Ben. As you got to know him more, he would gradually disclose vital details about his life, which by that point not only impacted him, but also impacted you. Less than a week after meeting Ben, I happened to run into him again at the library on my college campus. Being the extroverts we both are, we recognized each other immediately and struck up a friendly conversation. Knowing that Ben wasn't a college student, I asked him about what brought him to our library, to which he replied, oh, I, I just come here to use the printers and the Wi-Fi and the bathroom. I naively responded, oh, what's wrong with the bathroom at your place? Is it out of order? To which Ben said, no, I actually live in my car. It's really nice in there, though. I have a generator, which I use to produce heat. But right now in the winter, it's so cold that the generator doesn't work for extended periods of time. I was absolutely stunned. I had never met someone who was not only basically homeless, but spoke about their unconventional living situation in a way that showed they were visibly proud of it. All I could think to myself was, where do you shower? Where do you cook? And most importantly, how do you literally sleep at night? And in that perplexed state of mind, a wave of newfound empathy and cultural understanding washed over me. I suspect that it was a direct result of my anarchism and my introduction to alternative lifestyles, which caused me to respond to Ben with the following offer. Well, if it ever gets too cold at night, you're more than welcome to stay with me and my roommate, Jordan, at our place. Within just a few days after warmly extending this invitation to Ben, he took me up on my offer. And while I was surprised that Ben would want to stay with me and Jordan when we had all met so recently, Jordan and I chalked Ben's willingness and enthusiasm up to him being relatively new to the area and therefore probably not having many local friends. Ben, a 20-something without access to modern resources, was fascinated by all the little things in our apartment which we took for granted. The garbage disposal, the in-unit washing machine and dryer, and most of all, the full shower with a bathtub. Upon observing our amenities and receiving a full tour of our apartment, Ben shared with me and Jordan how excited he was to stay in a place with a kitchen, specifically so he could use that kitchen to cook. Ben continued in his musings about what he most loved to cook and how he liked to prepare his favorite dishes. And in the midst of his sheer joy, he volunteered the information that he would be unable to pay us back for his stay in our home because he did not have any money and he also did not have a job. Me and Jordan, both young women, in the midst of experiencing reformation from our own sheltered upbringings, looked at each other pensively for a moment and then collectively expressed out loud, 
that's not a problem at all. Yeah, rock on, fuck money. Who on earth needs money? Ben appeared very pleased with our immense understanding and exuberance, and he then offered to pay us back through a trade goods exchange by cooking meals for all of us during the entirety of his stay. At this point in our lives, Jordan and I were two 22-year-old college students without much money of our own, minimal ability to cook for ourselves, and a little access to nutritious home-cooked meals. So when we realized that we could get free food from this house guest in the comfort of our own home, merely in exchange for letting him sleep on our couch, we were in. However, there was a catch. You see, because Ben was unemployed and didn't have any money, he had to clarify that he had no way to buy ingredients for the meals he was supposedly going to cook for us. It was at this point when Ben shared with us the questionability, mystique, anarchy, and underground culture via which he actually got all of his food. Dumpster diving. <laughs> Jordan and I briefly glanced at each other wide-eyed with a hesitance conveying a mutual understanding of, if you're in, then I'm in. And thus, the home-cooked meals in exchange for a place to lay one's head at night, hot showers, and free Wi-Fi access, all in the comfort of the college apartment which my upper-middle-class father had co-signed for, began. Neither Jordan nor I had ever gone dumpster diving before. And to that effect, neither of us had a sincere interest in popping our trash rat cherries by doing the actual deed, so to speak. I recall pondering... Are the discarded goods just hanging out in clean trash bags because no one else wanted them? Or because it was food that actually went bad? If I go dumpster diving, what if I step in expired milk or touch rotten fruits and vegetables or get moldy jam all over my shirt? This is a no man's land for a reason. Anything could happen. Anarchism was already a stretch for me, but this, this is crossing the line. While Jordan and I were on the same page about not wanting to do the dumpster diving ourselves, eating food with ingredients which Ben had scavenged from the dumpster was a whole other can of worms. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Would we just let him dumpster dive for his own food and make do with what we could put together for ourselves instead? No, we couldn't do that, because this is supposed to be a trade goods exchange after all. What is the point of having Ben sleep on our couch if we get virtually nothing in return? It's all or nothing. We either agree to help Ben go dumpster driving so that we can get free food and he can have a warm place to stay for a couple of nights, or the deal is over. Speaking for both myself and Jordan, as I often did, I said to Ben, look, we know that you typically dumpster dive to get most of your food, but neither of us have ever gone dumpster diving before. We don't want this to be our first time, and we're a little weary of what you're going to pick out of there. So how about this? We will drive you to your favorite local dumpster, the one behind Aldi, so you can do your dumpster diving, and when you bring the food back to our apartment, we'll decide then if we want to actually eat it. Ben was in through thick and thin, even before Jordan and I had expressed any apprehensiveness. He continually reassured us that this wasn't his first rodeo, and he was an expert at selecting only the most safe to consume food from dumpsters. He knew how to separate out the actual good eggs from the actual bad eggs, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we decided all together to have our friend Emily drive us to Aldi in her car later that night, so that Ben's dumpster diving expedition could commence, and the three of us, me, Jordan, and Emily, would potentially reap the benefits. When we got to Aldi, Emily inconspicuously parked her car on the edge of the parking lot, but in front of the dumpster, so that we could speed forward and scoop up Ben on a moment's notice. At first, I innocently thought that once Ben was finished dumpster diving, he would just jump out of the dumpster and quietly stand next to it with whatever he had scavenged, thereby signaling to us that the mission was complete. Instead, as the three of us sat in Emily's car and looked off toward the trash area in the near distance, we realized we could clearly see that the dumpster which contained Ben's entire physical body inside of it appeared to be moving? 
oh my God, the reason the dumpster appeared to be moving was because it was moving. Ben's extremities were bumping into the walls of the dumpster from the inside as he was rummaging around for food that was safe to eat. It was almost like we were watching cartoon characters from a Looney Tunes sketch doing the same thing themselves. Right before my mother would snap me out of it by saying something like, don't get too close to the TV, it's bad for your eyes. Before I could even say anything, Emily said aloud, oh shit, you can tell that he's in there. We gotta go and make a run for it now, before he gets caught. In a flash, Emily hit the gas. Her car sped forward and we pulled right up to the dumpster. Jordan unlocked the passenger door for Ben and within a few seconds, he appeared on the pavement from inside the dumpster with a cardboard box in hand, entirely full of food and a bunch of other shit. Ben quickly hobbled around to the left side of the car and got into the passenger seat. Despite dying of immense laughter, I was somehow able to grab my phone and film Ben exiting the dumpster for Snapchat? <laughs> what can I say? I was a 20-something who wanted to prove to my peers that I do, in fact, have major street cred. <laughs> From there, we left the parking lot and drove off into the horizon as planned. Ben's dumpster diving excursion was a success. The car ride back to our apartment was nearly silent and as a result, incredibly awkward. The four of us were still internally processing through all of what we had just done. It felt like Ben was being subtly shunned by Emily and Jordan. They had socially exiled him to the corner of the back seat where he sat across from me. Emily and Jordan probably wanted nothing to do with Ben at that moment because of his newly accrued body odor. He smelled like old laundry detergent, moldy baked goods, and rotten vegetables, had a three-way, and then had a baby. <laughs> Despite this, I felt really bad for Ben. All he was trying to do was repay us for a good deed of allowing him to sleep on our couch in the only way he knew how. Looking back at my whole experience of getting involved with the local anarchist collective meeting Ben, and allowing him to sleep on our couch along with all of his antics, I see Ben in a flattering light. You see, Ben was the first person I ever met who chose to take the road less traveled in the face of all more likely odds. He lived on his own. He was openly and proudly living on government benefits. He didn't care about material possessions or financial wealth. And above all else, he always marched to the beat of his own drum and stayed true to himself. Meeting someone as unique and profound as Ben at only 22 years old showed me just how much I was capable of doing the same things as him, but for myself. Throughout the majority of my 20s, I've done so much shit which my family never expected, doesn't understand, and will never come to approve of. Moving cross country, getting fired from multiple jobs, having government benefits, being single for extended periods of time. The list goes on. Through challenges, through challenges and successes, I've had to learn how to prioritize my own sense of acceptance and approval of myself over that of anyone else. And I have people like Ben to thank for my introduction to that. Without Ben, I don't think I would have known a shining example of what it meant to believe in myself, even when it felt like nobody believed in me. You're probably wondering what the food which Ben cooked for us was ultimately like. <laughs> and more importantly, if any of us besides him actually ate it. During his stay in our apartment, the multiple meals which Ben prepared for us using ingredients from his treasure trove of dumpster goodies were nutritious, overall harmless, and dare I say, actually good? All of us ate together for two family-style meals post-dumpster dive, which came to be known as the first supper and the second supper. Even Emily gladly partook, since we felt she had earned a literal slice of the pie, too, for having driven the getaway car. Around this time, Jordan used to openly share with others that she was attempting to go vegan. So as a peace offering, Ben decided towards the end of his chef-in-residence debacle that he would make a vegan version of snickerdoodle cookies for all of us, but most especially for Jordan. However... Ben decided that he would bake these cookies using an expired bag of flour, which he had scavenged from the dumpster. And when he'd found this expired bag of flour, it had been suspiciously close to some old fabric softener, which of course, Ben took for us as well. I will never forget the experience of watching Jordan bite into one of Ben's deceptively appetizing snickerdoodle cookies, and then listening to her privately confide to me later, that cookie tasted faintly like a cleaning product. 
That was Vampire's Timer, Gabriela Levanos. <laughs> <laughs>